Welcome. Um, I'd encourage everybody to please join us at the round table. It doesn't look like it's going to be standing room only, so um, it, the more the merrier at the round table, please. Um, we are going to treat this session really truly as a round table, and so I uh, would encourage everybody to join us here so you can contribute uh, to the conversation. So it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to our roundtable discussion titled Digital Inclusion Through a Multilingual Internet. In this workshop, we will address three questions. First question is what are the barriers that are keeping people from using the internet in their own language? Second is how can we surmount these barriers through technical and policy coordination? And third, in what ways does internet multilingualism support the broader goal of digital inclusion? Uh, today we are joined by seven expert speakers, two of whom will be joining us uh, remotely. Um, uh, and a subset of each of our speakers will respond to each question. And so we will punctuate these sections with uh, discussion with the audience. Uh, but to begin, we will hear opening remarks from our expert speakers who graciously contributed their time to the organization of this roundtable and agreed to share their knowledge with us today. First, I will turn to Mr. Alan Davidson, the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Communications and Information and NTIA Administrator. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And uh, it's wonderful to be here this morning, uh, early on our day two. Uh, and um, uh, uh, thanks to those who are joining us online as well. Uh, and I really want to say how much we appreciate uh, our hosts here uh, in Kyoto for having us, uh, to the IGF for including this session, and uh, to all of my fellow speakers who are uh, going to contribute their, their expertise here. And at the starting point is we're, we're here today because connecting everyone to the internet is the first step in building a really inclusive digital society. Uh, and we know that being able to engage in one's own language online is key to meaningful connectivity. Uh, making the internet multilingual will support that connectivity, that meaningful uh, um, adoption and digital inclusion, and that's what we're here today to explore. Um, at NTIA, our starting point is uh, something that I think is intuitive to a lot of us who are here, which is that the internet is now the essential communications medium uh, in our modern world. It's essential for access to economic opportunity, to jobs, to education, to healthcare online, uh, to the world of knowledge. And uh, what is amazing, of course, is that here we are in 2023, and there are still millions of people, millions of people in the US, millions of people around the world who uh, are not online. And it may be because their connectivity is too poor. It may be that they lack the means or the tools or the um, uh, devices or the skills to get online, or they may not find content online that is compelling to them. Um, that has to change. And I'll say that domestically in the United States, we're working to tackle this problem in a big way. The US government is, uh, has dedicated uh, $65 billion in new funding to invest in a simple and ambitious mission in the US, which is to connect everyone with high-speed, reliable, affordable internet service. Internationally, we're trying to do our part as well. Uh, we're very proud to be part of the ITU's Partner to Connect initiative, which has been spearheaded by uh, NTIA alum <laughs> Doreen Bogdan Martin. Initiatives like that are, are helping us form the partnerships and mobilize the resources to connect the unconnected around the world. Uh, but we know that connectivity and access is just the baseline. We must both establish connectivity and make that connectivity meaningful. Our ultimate goal is to help people thrive online. And that comes to our topic today, which is making sure that people have the ability to use the internet in their own language. Everyone online deserves access to a digital sphere that is diverse and inclusive and serves their needs. Um, at NTIA, we have some experience now with language and connectivity. 
uh, most recently in our tribal access program, our tribal broadband connectivity program. The program dedicates uh, $3 billion to improving access and adoption on uh, Native American tribal lands. And an important part of this program that's been really interesting for us is, to f uh, is that we're funding remote educational activities, and that includes work to preserve indigenous languages. Um, this is crucial. In the U.S., there are 245 indigenous languages. 65 of them are already extinct, and 75 of them are considered near extinction, with only a few mostly elder speakers left. And our program awardees in this grant program are connecting their tribal language and culture uh, resources to the internet and digitizing tribal language materials. For example, we're funding a tribe, the Karuk tribe in California that's offering online classes in Native American learning and traditional skills. Um, we're doing something similar in Hawaii where uh, we've got a grant for a, a community that's hiring Native Hawaiian language specialists. Uh, to collect uh, and translate and record public records and stories and put them online where appropriate. Uh, in short, what we're trying to do with this tribal program is to connect Native communities to the internet in the languages that they speak and ensuring that they can engage with the internet in those languages. Uh, you know, a lot of times people think this is about uh, making sure that these communities get access to the resources that the internet offers. But one thing that I think we've also seen is this is about sharing their culture and their local knowledge with the rest of the world. So this isn't just about these communities somehow being able to access. It's also about all of us being able to understand and access their culture. And that's been incredibly meaningful in this program. So to conclude, I'll just say every, you know, we believe that every community deserves this same opportunity to meaningfully connect. Uh, our experience has shown that connectivity to the internet becomes much more rich and meaningful when you can connect in your own language. Uh, and while progress has been made, as we know, and we're going to talk about today, the internet is far from multilingual, but together we can change that. And particularly coordination around the promotion of universal acceptance the a technical foundation for a multilingual internet is going to be a critical tool. And uh, universal acceptance is a technical standard that enables domain names and email addresses to function in non-Latin scripts. Promoting it is going to be a foundational element, it is a foundational element of a multilingual internet. So it's very uh, exciting to be able to participate in this roundtable alongside some of the subject matter experts and institutions who are focused on driving universal acceptance forward. Thank you all for being here. And um, I'm going to turn it back over to, maybe I'll turn it back over to Susan. She can introduce the next speaker. And I will say to the folks in the room, I apologize. I'm going to have to leave shortly. But it is wonderful to be here. And we really appreciate uh, this work together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I would like uh, to turn next to uh, uh, Ram Mohan, is who we had um, scheduled. Oh, uh, online? Yeah. Okay. Please ask that Ram be unmuted. May we unmute uh, Ram Mohan, who is uh, joining us online. Uh, Ram was going to speak uh, to the background uh, and give some context to the evolution of the subject matter of universal acceptance. Susan, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes indeed. Hi, Ram. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, and sorry about the technical troubles. And uh, Secretary Davidson, thank you for your um, comments as well. Um, <clears throat> So universal acceptance, if you look at that as a uh, general topic, the way it has been introduced so far, uh, most people think of it as a technology topic, as something that we, um, um, we, we think of as how to make domain names interact with the domain name system. In reality, however, this is a human problem, and this is really a human topic. How do you make systems, computers, and the way we communicate 
how do we make various communication systems interact with each other? You know, um, I, I think it is it is quite um, I, I think it is quite remarkable that if you type in your email address to register for uh, a website, that email address uh, sometimes will work. Many times it doesn't. The reason why it doesn't is not because the email address is wrong or is incorrectly formatted. It's because somebody somewhere decided that the last uh, part of the email address, the one that ends in .jp or the one that ends in .us, uh, if it is a domain name or, or a, an identity, for example, that is uh, the one that I that my, that I work for, which ends in .digital. Somebody decides .digital is not valid, and therefore you cannot actually use these systems. So if you look at the that really is universal acceptance. How do you make all names that are valid on the internet? How do you make them interoperable and work with each other? But there is one level above that which is the issue of inclusivity. If you have names that don't interact with each other, if you have systems that don't work with each other, how can you genuinely say that we are building a internet and a human society that includes all digital natives? And that ladies and gentlemen, is really the next generation. Everybody who is in the room has learned about the internet, but everybody who is being born today and who is going to school today, the internet is just a native digital thing for them. How do we make sure that those who have a digitally native Japanese address, a digitally native Arabic address, how do we make sure that they all work and interact together? The solution to that is not technical. The solution to that is something that all of us have to work together to build policy and other governance systems that encourage the universal acceptance of names. Thank you, Ram. That was, uh, that was excellent. I really appreciated how you tied, tied all of this together. And just to note that uh, Ram is the Chief Strategy Officer at Identity Digital. My apologies, Ram, I should have introduced you beforehand. Um, I think next we may turn to our colleague, Dawit Bekele, who is the Regional Vice President, Africa Internet Society. Um, Dawit, are you able to join us? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can indeed. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm joining from my phone, so I apologize if uh, the sound and picture is not very good. Uh, uh, thank you, Suzanne, for uh, inviting me for this meeting, which I believe is very important. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to talk uh, about uh, an issue that is very important for me, since I speak one of the languages that are not considered as uh, very pro prominent uh, in, on the internet. Uh, I believe that access to the internet is a critical need, if not a human right in, the, in today's world. Long gone are the days where the internet was a nice to have tool, it is a must-have tool for almost anyone around the world, since many things that we used to do online, offline, I mean, like government services, education, work, are moving online in unprecedented speed, like uh, all around the world. But too many people, more than a third of the world's population, don't have access to the internet. Almost equally worrying, too many people amongst the so-called connected don't have meaningful connectivity. According to the ITU, meaningful connectivity is a level of connectivity that allows users to have a safe, satisfying, enriching, and productive online experience at an affordable cost. For example, in many places in Africa, 
the cost of connectivity is so high that many people cannot afford to use it for important activities such as learning online. And of course, if the content you want to access is not in a language that you don't you understand, your connectivity is meaningless. The world has made great progress on connecting more and more people in the last decades, which is encouraging. We should all work together to connect the unconnected, including those that live in remote areas, in disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities like the uh, indigenous people that Mr. Davidson was talking about, etc., that are not interesting for commercial operators. But we should also work to give everyone this planet meaningful connectivity. That is an internet access that is affordable, safe, and that she or he can use to improve her or his life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dawit. Um, now, for to continue our opening remarks, um, I would like to turn to Edmund Chung, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Dot Asia and uh, ICANN board member. Over to you, Edmund. Thank you, Susan. And um, um, I guess uh, I'll, I'll, this is a topic that that is very dear to my heart. For those of you who know me, um, this is a topic that I've been uh, championing for for the last 25 years. Um, why is it taking so long? Well, let's talk about that. Um, and building off from, I guess, uh, what Secretary uh, Davidson mentioned as, I guess, really a very important part, which is that the universal acceptance really is a foundation towards digital inclusion. And to unpack that a little bit, um, in a, you know, a, a foundation towards digital inclusion is a fully multilingual internet. And universal acceptance makes a fully in multilingual internet. And today, um, what is uh, still, I find, startling is that almost 60% of the internet's content is still in English. Um, and that doesn't reflect the real world. Um, there are almost 7,000 languages around the world. Many of them are here uh, in Asia, where we are. And um, really, a, a multilingual internet is essential for trying to bring the next billion to, to come online because those are the, that is the uh, uh, group of people, those are the people where English is definitely not a first language, and in fact, they might not know English very well. So for, for the, the next billing to really be able to meaningfully come online, um, internationalized domain names and the universal acceptance of them is really a foundation towards that. Um, one of the things that um, I, I, I often talk about is that this is, uh, uh, as actually building on what Ram said, is that we have gone beyond uh, the technical uh, items. Um, you know, in fact, in the last 25 years, that's why it took so long. For the first 10, 12 years, we were struggling with, uh, you know, well, not struggling, and really working hard to build the technology um, that, that allows internationalized domain names and email addresses to work. Uh, on the internet in a secure and stable manner. Then we spent 10, 12 years working through the policies because the policies are equally important. Um, using just 26 characters uh, plus the 10 digits for domain names, uh, you know, uh, have th its own challenges, but trying to bring, you know, tens of thousands of characters uh, into that system, and there are other linguistic uh, issues that need to be dealt with through, through policies. And that's what we did in the last 25 years. So now is the time, the, um, I guess, the, the rubber hits the road, and we need to keep driving it. Um, and the other thing that I always like to us to think through um, is that we really need a kind of movement, because um, this is not, um, there, there is what I would call a kind of a, uh, a market failure right now. Uh, if you ask people who doesn't know uh, very much about the, the domain name system or the internet technologies, when, they, when you explain to them, they can actually use Japanese, they can use Indian, uh, Hindu, Indic languages uh, to navigate the internet. There's like, sign me up. But um, 
the, the, the problem is that that is a latent demand because they don't even know that they can demand for it. The other side of the story is also suppliers are also unaware of the impact they're causing. I'm not saying that suppliers are not aware of the technology part uh, because that uh, through the 20 years that uh, I think most of the developers and you know, uh, 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 suppliers of uh, web hosting, registries, registrars do know. In fact, registries and registrars do provide uh, IDN registrations, but are they ready for web hosting? Are they ready for internationalized email addresses? U universal acceptance is readiness is still very low. But the technology part, if you ask Google, Gmail is actually internationalized uh, 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 email address ready. Outlook is also ready. But does that mean the entire suite of Google services? Does that mean the entire suite of uh, Microsoft products are UA ready? Unfortunately, that's no. Um, what, we, what is interesting, I uh, adding to my rhetoric about a, a needing a movement, I recently come across, I think, uh, uh, Secretary just mentioned a little bit as well what is called, well, he didn't mention it, but he touched on what is uh, language justice. Um, we must have heard of climate justice, we might have heard of many types of justice, but there is actually language justice as well. And that's why we need a movement. That's why, you know, a multilingual uh, internet is important. And I think the, 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 the technical community, some of the technical community is still resistant. Um, you know, they, it has, they have been resistant from, from the very beginning. One of the things being a lot of the uh, uh, technology uh, providers are still very much English-centric. Uh, and because of that, they are, they are sometimes worried. Um, you know, well, if someone uses a multilingual email address, am I going to be able to see it? Am I going to, uh, is it the administration going to be problematic? Is it going to be difficult for me? There is a little bit of resistance, but we need to convince them. We need to convince them that their work, their engineering work on all the interfaces, all the display, all the storage, all the processing has an impact on language justice. And also, if you look at the statistics, if, well, of course, people say it because nobody's using internationalized domain names, there's not much b abuse. But if you look at the real statistics, DNS abuse is a fraction in terms of internationalized domain names. You know, it's like a uh, much lower percentage. And a more important thing for, for to convince the, the technical community, I believe, is to tell them that a multilingual internet actually makes for a safer internet. You know, my dad going online, when he looks at the, the URL bar, he doesn't understand it. But if it is in Chinese, he'll be able to figure it out. What, you know, for, for a normal user, actually a multilingual internet makes for a much safer internet. So I want to start you with this thought, um, finally. Um, many people say it's, it's all about the content and the uh, domain name part and the email address. People don't even use. But if you think about it, um, the DNS was introduced in 1983. When was the web introduced? That was 1989. Six years ahead of time, that's what set the English-only naming system and paved the way for English-dominant web. So maybe it's a hindsight thing, uh, but if you have a forward-looking perspective, I think it, you can understand that the foundations of the naming system does pave the way for content, and that's why, without universal acceptance of internationalized domain names, a, a multilingual internet cannot be realized. And it is a matter of language justice, and that is why we need a multilingual internet movement. And I hope I can convince you to start here, uh, and this is the community to start that movement. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Edmund. A number of compelling points there. Um, uh, and in particular, the multilingual internet makes for a safer internet for, uh, for many. So thank you for that. Um, and I would like now to turn to the Senior Vice President uh, of Global Domains and Strategy at ICANN, um, Teresa Swing here. Here, Teresa. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, first of all, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and um, to hear the remarks. Uh, and Edmund, um, your passion is fantastic. And the part he didn't mention is he uh, heads up also the board working group on IDN and UA. Uh, so we have an opportunity to work together uh, on quite a few things. Um, so from, from an ICANN standpoint, um, we, we share the importance of the inclusivity and the opportunity for everybody to use any language they want and any script they want. And this is an incredibly important aspect that we've heard um, in the other remarks uh, today. And to the points that have been made, it's not that the technology isn't available, it's actually the ability to use it uh, around the world for whichever languages. And we heard some different statistics, but I'll throw a little bit more out and then share um, you know, where we're coming from as an organization working with the community and the board uh, on this. So apparently, you know, there's about 5.4 billion people uh, from all different cultures and languages around the world. There's about 2.6 uh, that have never been online. Uh, and there's reasons they haven't been online. It might be access uh, to the internet. It may be for any other reason. Uh, but the power to use your own language to express yourself in your own language is incredibly important. We all know it if we have to experience a conversation in a language that's not our own. It's challenging. It takes a different kind of energy. It takes a different form of recognition of the words and what they mean and the interpretations around it. So if we look at the currently about 6,500 languages that are around the world, but we look at the breakdown, there's about 2,300 spoken in Asia, 2,100 spoken in Africa, 1,300 in the Pacific, 1,000 in the Americas, and about 280 in Europe, plus what we heard earlier within the United States, even uh, local tribes and, and linguistics there. It's not just about people using their own language, it's also the preservation of languages. It's part of, uh, it's part of the global understanding of different cultures. If you then look further, there's about 1.3 people speaking Chinese, the more, majority of which, approximately 900 million Mandarin, many of which are outside of China. Six, uh, 610 million people uh, speak Hindi, and another 300 million speak Arabic. This is around the world. These are potential users that may use the internet even more if they can express themselves in their own languages. But to the universal acceptance standpoint, you may have an address, you may have a domain name, but you may not be able to use it on the platforms you want to or ensure that there's a receipt from the other party. So the work around universal acceptance, the awareness around it and the opportunities is, is an incredibly important part. It's not just an economic aspect and the statistics around the economics you know, indicate you know, 9.8 billion growth opportunities, that's from 2017, but it's also the societal opportunities and the next users uh, from that standpoint. So from an ICANN standpoint, we have a few things that we've been engaged in. Uh, one is uh, the support for Universal Acceptance Day, and we can talk about that later. That had a large uh, impact, uh, and looking forward to partnering with many different organizations in the future. And then we also have what's referred to as the next round of top-level domains, uh, which affords an opportunity for those that wish to, to apply also for a name that is in their own language, in their own script. The application process will open up. There'll be opportunities there, hopefully for all the 600 or 6,500 languages in all the different parts of the world, whether they're small communities. But the important part is that universal acceptance exists so that those names can actually resolve fully at a global level. Uh, so I'll leave it there and then look forward to talking a little bit more about some details of things that we're doing. Check. <laughs> I'm all set. Thanks. Um, thank you so much. So uh, we have just had an excellent, um, I think, intro a set of introductory remarks that covered the history and background, um, giving context to universal acceptance, the importance of meaningful connectivity, and thank you to Dawit uh, for defining what that, that means. That was a very useful definition. 
uh, the importance of UA to um, to non English or non Latin speaking countries and uh, uh, and also um, really the foundation of UA uh, towards digital inclusion and some very helpful statistics. I thought those were quite important. So. Um, with all of that said, I might ask folks who are in the room, and again, please feel free. Well, uh, feel free to come sit at the round table if you're in the uh, the seats. You are most welcome. But I'd like to just turn it over to uh, attendees to see if there are any reflections or contributions that they would like to make, and then we will move into our uh, our the first of our three questions. Anybody have anything they would like to contribute? Yeah, please. Hello, my name is Keisuke Kamimura. I'm I'm a linguist by training and profession, uh, and I am not a, an expert on technology here. But um, this is my observation: universal acceptance is important, and uh, it is annoying that you cannot use internationalized. Uh, email addresses in various applications. So I completely agree with uh, many of you here. But uh, on the other hand, um, we don't really use uh, domain names for identifying information and, and, and identifying uh, yourself in email. We tend to use uh, Facebook, Twitter, or and, uh, other forms of social media uh, where you do not uh, particularly typically use uh, domain names or uh, lengthy identifiers. So uh, my question is, uh, is, is domain name or internationalized domain name still relevant in uh, making internet uh, more uh, um, diverse and multilingual information space? And um, Another question is how people, um, uh, do, do, do users prefer to use uh, internationalized domain names uh, as opposed to other forms, forms of domain names like GTLDs and CCTLDs? Um, I have done a survey on the user uh, behavior on internationalized domain names compared to other type of, types of domain names uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and, and I found out that uh, they have clear, distinct um, users have different behaviors over uh, GTLDs and internationalized domain names. So uh, if you talk about universal acceptance, you have to consider how people react to um, um, multilingualism on the internet. So uh, this is my observation. Thank you very much. Oh, um, I, I think we have a hand up online, perhaps to respond to this question uh, from from Ram. So I, I heard two I heard two very interesting questions that you've posed. Um, the f the first relates to kind of the 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 meaning of identity and how that is expressed on social media and other platforms versus a domain name, and then the second is. Uh, pertains to IDNs and GTLDs and CCTLDs. I'm happy to have uh, somebody um, uh, also address that question uh, uh, because I'm not sure they're necessarily so distinct. Um, but let's turn to Ram. Thank you, Susan. And uh, thank you for a, a terrific question. Uh, two things that we should think about, it's not only about email addresses and a domain name. Uh, think of writing something in a, in a Word document and you're typing in an email address or you're typing in a website address. Today, it automatically becomes a hyperlink if it is validated, if it is um, supposed to be a real name. However, if those systems do not understand the, the identity that you're typing, then your company's name, your organization's name um, that is represented on the internet 
may simply not convert automatically into a hyperlink. So that is part of universal acceptance. Um, and it, to some extent, is not just about in your language. It is about making sure that whatever it is uh, represented in, whether it is in your local language or whether it is in ASCII, in, in, um, in the Latin script, so long as it is a valid name that is accepted by the authorities on the internet, it ought to just work everywhere, right? So uh, we have to, I think, start thinking about these less and less as identifiers and more and more as ways of communication between human beings. And whether it is a website address, whether it is a domain name address, an email address, or uh, if you go to many of the social media sites that are there right now, they give you the opportunity. Uh, if you want to link to your biography, for example, on a site like LinkedIn, they give you the opportunity to type in a URL, uh, a website address. However, if that website address is not recognized due to universal acceptance issues, you are not included into that digital ecosystem anymore. You are forced to go to a, in many cases, inferior system to represent who you are. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. And Edmund, please. Yeah, I just want to add a little bit. I, I think those are very good questions and uh, raised a number of times. Uh, whether domain names are still relevant and you know email address is still relevant. So I'd like to say three things, really. One is that um, search, uh, you know, if you think about search, um, typing in the local language is not a problem at all, right? I mean, so typing in uh, an IDN has no challenge uh, for the local community. So that is very important. And direct navigation on the internet is still uh, utilizing domain names. Uh, and so that's, I think, is, it's, it remains relevant. Number two, on email addresses. Um, I think most, if not all, of the cybersecurity training that I've given and I've listened to starts with email address. The first thing I teach my dad when, you know, see whether there's spam or, you know, uh, with scam is to look at the email address that is being sent. And that's why, you know, it's still relevant. And that's why I think, you know, um, what I mentioned as a multilingual internet makes for a safer internet because that is the fundamental. Because that's the first thing you teach uh, a, an, an elderly using the internet and say, stop being scammed is to, well, look at who sent you the email first. That's, you know, so I think that's important. And the third thing I want to mention is that in terms of the users, I, I'm not sure if you saw the um, ALAC end user survey, the at large uh, end user survey that, that, that was uh, commissioned at ICANN. And the findings are interesting. And, you know, I guess that the, the findings you have is, 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 is relevant and, um, and corroborates. But there's an additional question that was asked that I think was really revealing which I touched on earlier, for people who don't know that there is uh, IDNs and don't know there is an option, when they first listened, heard it through the survey, they were excited about it. They want it. But those who actually know about it says it's not so useful. Well, that is a revealing issue, right? The reason why, and that's why we're talking about it here, is that they registered and they couldn't use it. Was the web hosting ready? Was the email ready? You know, the, the problem is not so much that end users doesn't want to use it. The problem is it cannot be used very, you know, smoothly on the internet. So it's not set up properly. It's not, you know, cannot be actually used uh, in, in, in a good way. Um, and it's sort of like a second class citizen right now. And that's, I think, the, the, the bigger problem. So, so that study, I think, is quite revealing when, when you look at those, those statistics as well. I couldn't find it uh, uh, right now, but I'm sure we can dig it up. Thank you, Edmund. Um, Ter Teresa, would you like to contribute? Yeah, um, I'd be really interested to see the study because it's um, 
the, the points that are being made are really quite revealing, also from another angle, right? And there's the, the question of demand, um, or why may there not be demand for it, uh, or awareness around it. And then to the points that Ram and Edmund had made, it's also about the, the user's seamless experience. Um, we've all had experience with I don't know, something online, and then it turns that the interface to something else doesn't allow it to happen, so you have to go back and do something else and then go back and make sure it works, whether it's a payment method or whether it's something else. Um, and so in the end, it's really about um, also ensuring that regardless if the unique identifier is at the front end or in a document or a reference tool that the experience for the user has the opportunity to be seamless as, as part of a global internet from that standpoint. And, you know, there's, I appreciate, there's there's areas that are within ICANN's remit more specifically, and then there's things that are not, and obviously enjoy facilitating and being part of conversations and partnering with others around the awareness there. Um, from, from an overall standpoint, um, I, I think that there's also, uh, the elements of how does one contribute to the user awareness um, and you know you you get a new laptop or you get a new phone and it says you know do you want to use English or German or whatever language it might be or you know and do you want to have I don't know Siri and do you want to have payment online and all these different things um, even if there's just a question of do you want to check whether you can use the device in your language preferred language uh, and is it going to work with others, some forms of questions, it creates the user awareness that they might have the option. Um, this is an area way out of my purview and expertise and certainly not a remit within ICANN, but um, more generally from a global level, the, the awareness of what opportunities could I have uh, to do something I think is valuable, and sometimes it's... Um, Sometimes it's hard, but it's about what's the right thing to do for a global level to, to enable people to use their languages of their choice. Um, but the study is very interesting, and I've sort of gone on, but I think in the end it's really about the seamless experience uh, for anybody to do what they want to the right of the dot or to use the languages and scripts that they would like to use. So. Thank you, Teresa. Um, now I'd like for us to move into our uh, policy questions. Um, <clears throat> And the first question here is, what are the barriers that are keeping people from using the internet in their own language? And I'd just like to turn first to Dawit, um, and then uh, we will turn to uh, our colleague Akinora, Akinori Maimura, who is the general manager, um, inter de internet development of the Japan Network Information Center. So we'll first uh, hear from Dawit and then Akinori. Uh, thanks, Susan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many barriers contribute to the challenges people face in using the internet in their own language. Uh, here are some of the most important ones, in my opinion. Uh, first, if you don't have access to the internet or you can't afford it, you can't use the internet in any language. And the digital divide is very often on linguistic lines. Uh, for example, as you have heard at the opening, Indigenous people often lack connectivity that had an impact on the use of their languages on the internet. Second, some languages have limited digital content due to social, economic, and political reasons. Uh, for example, most of the more than 2,000 languages that uh, Teresa mentioned in Africa uh, are not recognized as official languages in their own countries, limiting the support for content development in those languages. Third, the barrier can be technological. I will mention only two of these technological barriers that used to be barriers for my own mother tongue, Amharic, that uses the Ethiopic script. The Ethiopic script was not included in Unicode until about the year 2000. This means before that, it was close to impossible to have an Amharic content that everybody can read easily. Uh, thankfully, Ethiopic and many other scripts and alphabets are now part of Unicode, but this is not the case of all scripts and alphabets. Another major technical barrier is the lack of support for many languages by devices and platforms. 
there are many people who are literate in their own language only, for which their devices and or the platform they want to use are not localized, for, which limits their use of the internet. Uh, the fourth barrier is the lack of digital literacy. Uh, unfortunately, the poorer the community, the less it is literate, digital literate. Thus, poorer communities tend not to have their languages fairly represented on the internet. There are, of course, many other barriers for which I don't have time to discuss in detail here. Those barriers include, but are not limited to uh, limitations of IDNs, as it has been said by other speakers, a lack of relevant content, internet shutdowns and restrictions, the saturation of the internet with the so-called global languages, such as English. But to end with some positive note, even though the barriers are many and are often huge, there are some hopes. Technological advances are making access to content in other languages possible through automatic translation. And we have seen it with AI recently, even interpretation. Governments, tech companies, and other service providers are taking more and more seriously the, local, the issue of localization. There are more and more technical advances and solutions, such as community networks, that can provide connectivity even, even for the most uh, remote communities. Therefore, if governments, tech companies, local communities, civil societies, and international organizations, and many other uh, stakeholders work together, we can create a fairer internet for all languages. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tawit. And I just uh, want to pause to uh, look around the room and to see if anybody has um, any similar kind of experiences uh, that Tawit had just outlined and would like to share. Um, if uh, Yes, Roberto, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, Roberto Gaetano from European User Association. Um, I, I would like to, to add the point because when we think about uh, underserved communities in terms of languages, uh, I think that most of us uh, think uh, also situations like uh, Africa that was presented or, or South America or... Um, I would like to make an example that is related to my country, that, that is Italy. Um, in Italy, we have... Uh, uh, several languages, I'm not talking about dialects, I'm talking about real languages uh, that are not officially recognized, uh, most of them are not, a couple are, but um, I'm talking about uh, Furlan, I'm talking about Sardo, I'm talking about Arbresh, and, and those are local uh, communities, uh, and, and I think that there's a role that uh, in the even if, in a developed country, or supposed to be uh, like Italy, uh, the, the, there is a, a role that the internet uh, can play in terms of allowing, uh, um, uh, f favoring local contact, favoring the distribution the, the, of information in that language. Um, a few years ago, we had uh, at the IGF Italy, um, a session about this, about uh, uh, what is the impact of the internet uh, on uh, local communities who speak uh, uh, a language that is not recognized. And that was uh, quite interesting. Why is this a policy question? Because without, for instance, help by the government, uh, without uh, also the uh, awareness of the community, this cannot be done. I'm talking about uh, these languages, I, I um, call them uh, endangered languages, because uh, uh, also with the globalization, the, the, the community that speak that language is going to shrink unless we support this. And I think that the richness, the, the diversity of culture has to be, um, has to be preserved. And, and there's a role that the internet can play in this. Thank you so much, Roberto. Um, and now, I, oh, uh, here, please go ahead. If you could introduce yourself, that would be great. 
Hello. Um, my name is Rafiq. I, I work at uh, Internews. Um, and one of the topics that I work on is um, content moderation in non-European languages. Um, and I think that there's a really, there's a kind of a, an issue where you have, um, when you don't have a lot of content on the open internet in a specific language, it tends to drive people towards platforms. Um, you know, Facebook most obviously. Um, I spent a lot of years living in Myanmar, which, which is kind of the textbook case for Facebook becoming the, the kind of stand-in internet. Um, and I think that that's a really important phenomenon in this wider discussion because uh, to Edmund's point about, you know, a multilingual internet being a safer internet, um, in these smaller languages, you, you, you don't have functional content moderation. I think, um, uh, you know, a platform like Facebook has content moderation in maybe 75 languages. Um, but you, you do have people using those platforms um, in, you know, a thousand different languages. Um, and you have very robust communities um, using those platforms uh, instead of the open internet. Um, uh, in effectively an unmoderated way, but still with all of the kind of amplification and things that you see um, uh, through those platforms. Um, so I don't know if that's kind of within the, the remit of this discussion, but I just, I, I think it's a really important point. Thank you. I think that um, your point uh, kind of dovetails with our, our uh, question earlier from our, our linguist colleague. Um, and so that, that adds a really interesting dimension to the discussion. So much appreciated, thank you. Oh yes, please. You're welcome to. <laughs> sure, thank you. Uh, I want to share a view from a regular user's perspective. Uh, one of the main barriers actually a lack of demand due to, I would say like um, linguistic fitness of input methods. I would like to say, uh, for example, I use a country code as an example. If I type it on the keyboard, there's only three buttons, and I solve the problem. If I use my native language, I would use a dozen. I would have to press a dozen buttons. So for any regular users, if three buttons can solve the problem, why would he or she go for a dozen? So it's a simple question for the regular users, which is uh, the linguistic fitness to our input method, which is a linguistic technical issue. Uh, so for any language that is easier to transfer into alphabetic, that uh, can be contained in a small keyboard, it will be easier to uh, promote uh, IDN. But for any a language that is not very fit to the alphabetic, uh, that will be difficult. So, uh, and uh, consider today the, uh, how to say, the, the most majority input method is still alphabetic keyboard. So that would be uh, create uh, the uh, lack of demand to regular users, since shorter and easier would be always the choice. It's simple, simple concept. And if in the future, like a uh, vocal input or even brain input got promoted, that would be much more easier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, th I think the question of um, kind of practicalities <laughs> is a useful one. Um, and on, on that note, I was wondering if Aki Nori might um, be able to turn to you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Aki Nori Maimura from Japan Network Information Center. Uh, great to be here. That, that's quite, you know, uh, the discussion uh, until now is already overwhelmingly exciting. <laughs> uh, to, to pick up the uh, various, uh, various aspects of the idea and, and like, the universal acceptance. Uh, the barrier uh, for the for the uh, to uh, using the internet uh, in in our own languages, it's a uh, quite uh, a good question. And then I I would like to talk about a little bit uh, uh, you know uh, uh, past uh, situation. Uh, Thirty years ago, we uh, we, uh, start, we started uh, using the internet and uh, started using the PC. Uh, at the time, I, do, I remember that that my uh, my PC, uh, uh, my system uh, system itself, o o OS and some other environment of uh, what, uh, which I used, 
is uh, not really good uh, to, uh, to handle the Japanese. And then there's a lot of uh, funny, uh, funny characters in my, in, in my display, for example, the black square, that means that, uh, that, means that uh, the, some, some character who, uh, which, can, uh, which the system cannot ha handle. So, uh, you know, it is really hard to use the internet by, the, by Japanese uh, because of that kind of that, uh, errors, and then uh, it is uh, it it actually uh, 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 over, uh, overcome later, and then uh, I, we don't have almost, almost virtually no no problem to use the use my own language, which is Japanese, uh, in uh, in the PC and uh, IT, IT systems. So uh, it is improved. And then, uh, actually, the, the Professor Kamimura, uh, who, who made an uh, intervention uh, before, is uh, the professional for the, such, a, such an inclusion of the languages to the, to the IT. Then, then he's, he's, he could be, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, he, he could make, uh, make a good input for that. But uh, such, in such way that the PC uh, system, for example, the OS, and then uh, the computer system, gradually include a lot of languages to the to the uh, to our own use so uh, then uh, now now the as 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 well uh, as well as japanese uh, many languages are available for in, in, in the pc and then uh, for the for the domain names uh, i i need to need to need to tell that uh, uh, yes yes yeah, idn is already ready and then, uh, for example, the, uh, for the .jp domain name, we can we can use the the Japanese label at the second level .jp. That's that's available, but not popular, because the uh, uh, dom domain name is the, the for for us the uh, ja Japanese the normal Japanese people has no no problem to uh, read and write the. Uh, alphabets that they are, they are already our own uh, within our, our own uh, own knowledge, and then uh, the it's actually preferred to use the uh, alphabet for the for the, that kind of the identifiers. It's simple. The very compact set of the, the characters, 20, 26 plus uh, plus alpha uh, character to identify something. It's actually su suffices. Then uh, that's and and the simple and then sometimes cool. Uh, yeah, J J Japanese uh, feel like that. So uh, uh, the 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 uh, ASCII character is uh, preferred for for that kind of the use. It is not a, uh, not a natural language, you know. Uh, the, for example, the literature. Literature we definitely need the Japanese and a lot of Han characters uh, that that's exceeding the ten thousand needed for the, the smooth and the fine literature. But uh, but that's a, that's an identifier. So uh, it's a uh, quite quite a, quite a uh, you know. Uh, that's uh, uh, good enough with uh, using the 20, 26 uh, characters, but that's one of the point. But I completely understand the inclusion is important, and, and the Edmund, Ed, Edmund pointed out a very good, a very good point of the language justice. That's that's we we need to do. You know, uh, for example. <laughs> I am now t telling something in, in English, but uh, I'd like to do that in Japanese. And then you, you understand correctly my, my uh, including my nuance. Then it is, I, 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 would, I would feel very, very you know, included in, in the situation. I try very hard to use English for, for this kind of international situation. So uh, the, my point is, um, uh, the, with that, the, the, the language inclusion is very important, and then uh, uh, not everyone can use the English, but uh, 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 only only use the, their own language. But uh, the, uh, for example, I, I, I was uh, I was having for uh, I can uh, board, and then at that time, my point is that to need to include everyone and the every everyone who. Uh, use uh, the various languages, and then we need to be prepared for that. And then, then the, uh, the, the em employing that kind of system is uh, just just uh, left to the, the operators and the IT vendors. So uh, they, they, uh, we try to ask them to use that. So that, that that's actually the, the effort of the universal acceptance. So uh, uh, my point is that the barrier should be. The, for example, the, uh, as 
uh, as we, uh, as the PC system, the computer system uh, included the various languages, then then uh, the people who use the uh, computer system uh, is uh, they can use their own language. So uh, the, the uh, su such kind of environment, the, the computer system, and then uh, for example the the IT system to to you know accept the the e-commerce uh, enrollment and then uh, order uh, are, uh, should should be uh, should should uh, uh, should be able to handle such a multilingual uh, input. Then uh, the, the, they they are not uh, created and developed by the by the software house, but uh, it's the most of, most of all cases they, they, uh, that kind of system provided. The, the platform uh, is provided by the very big vendors, so uh, we uh, we need to the, such a the very big uh, vendor for the uh, the the platform, which is widely used, uh, uh, the employ the universal acceptance. Then uh, then then uh, everyone in the world can be uh, included by the using the, their own languages. That's my point. Thank you. Thank you, Akinori. Um, I have some some reactions to that, but I just want to check around the room first to see if anybody else would like to respond to Akinori. Um, <coughs> so it seems that uh, the ultimate objective, of course, is being able to offer uh, everybody the option um, and to build upon uh, a, a new status of connecting and using the internet in their own language and their own script, but just recognizing that some, um, some communities um, have already kind of adapted to the, the ASCII-only uh, system that has been built up over, over several years, and there have been some um, kind of patterns and businesses, pra business practices, uh, that have been built around the existing system. With that said, I don't think it's it's certainly uh, um, I don't think it's a counter argument to to UA, but it's just something that might be useful to note um, as part of the discussion. Um, so thank you very much for that, Akinori. Uh, our next question is: How can we surmount the barriers that we have just? discussed through technical and policy coordination. Ram, during uh, his opening intervention, had mentioned that it's, and Edmund, I believe you mentioned this as well, it's not so much a technical problem because the work has been done. It's a coordination problem and it's a policy problem and it's a visibility problem, I think, for governments. Um, and so my, my next question uh, goes to you, Edmund, is, how can we surmount uh, uh, barriers uh, through technical and policy coordination? Thanks. Thank you, and um, yes, I guess uh, as both Ram and I mentioned, uh, we are you know, at a, a very low level technical part, which is the protocols and those kind of things, we are beyond that. But the technical implementation uh, is still, you know, a, a big challenge. And we've heard from different um, parties. In fact, um, one of the things that is important is uh, 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 to convince the technical community that it is an important thing. Um, and just to rely on market forces, I believe, is not enough because I think the market has spoken a little bit in saying that um, we tried this, we offered this, but nobody is using it. Um, but why are nobody using it? Because they can't use it uh, uh, smoothly. So we're in a chicken and egg uh, situation right now, and that comes to the policy part. The fundamental policies for enabling internationalized email uh, addresses and domain names are there. So there is the uh, IDN uh, uh, tables, there is the uh, different uh, language policies for registrations of these unique identifiers. Those are there. But what is not there are policy interventions that would motivate uh, suppliers to, to flesh out the, the implementation for universal acceptance, ensure that everything is uh, 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 as easy to use for an, um, a, a, a multilingual email address than, than not. Uh, just as a good example, I mean, um, many registries, um, I actually don't know in China or Japan, do allow uh, 
for example, Chinese and Japanese domain registrations, but what if the user uses a Chinese email address to register that domain? Does your system support that? Maybe, maybe not. I would guess not today. Um, and that, those, are the, those are the things that, you know, once you use it, you don't, you know, uh, can't. So I think the technical part is trying to convince uh, technical people um, that this is important and you know uh, on the policy side it is about you know having policy intervention to motivate uh, uh, um, uh, suppliers to actually put in place and uh, the I, I think the uh, uh, was a little bit touched on by secretary uh, earlier uh, but there's also the international decade of indigenous languages that is there, the sustainable development goals that touches on innovation and heritage and local culture. Those are the things that, that we need to, to, to tell people that you know, it's not just about, well, we can also use these um, cool ASCII domains, but when we talk about choice, the other side is important as well. Yes, we can choose these cool names, but what if I want to choose a local name? Right now, it's difficult. So choice, yeah, that's the, the market side. The other thing, one, one last thing that I want to touch on um, is in response to, I, I'm guessing the, this, the, the, the speakers from, from, from Chinese, uh, because they're talking about input methods. I even put method in Chinese as well. And so yeah, maybe a few more keyboard strokes. Um, um, but ask any Chinese or, you know, ask Baidu, do they have problems searching in Chinese? I don't think they search in English, right? I mean, even for just a few more keystrokes, they would search in Chinese. And, you know, so navigating should not be a problem. And the other thing about, uh, I guess, in terms of ICANN and the top-level domains, the uh, speaker mentioned that um, just three keystrokes can, can type a top-level domain. Why would you bother? Well, that is why single character Chinese domain names and single character Chinese top level domains is so important because one single character in Chinese means a word and that can be done in two, three strokes. So hopefully that adds. Yes, absolutely it does, thank you. And I wanna see if we can turn to Ram. Uh, thank you, Susan. Yeah. Um, so, as, as Edmund said, the, the core technical challenges uh, and the, co the core technical contours of this problem are already solved. How to make these identifiers work with each other is already a known thing. That is not something that we ought to be focusing time and effort on. In the real world, this is really for a, an organization of any size and scope. This is a little bug, a little thing that has to be resolved. The reason, in my opinion, why universal acceptance, multilingualism, and digital inclusion of this kind has not yet become um, an automatic default uh, is because we need a bit more policy coordination. We need a bit more in the, on the side of incentives. Because if you look at it, it the, the problem that we're talking about is so small relative to large issues that organizations and technical uh, firms have to deal with that they shrug their shoulders and say, this is just a little thing and nobody is complaining. So, so long as there are no complaints, it's all right. We can just move forward. But imagine a world where for every procurement that every government does, imagine a world where the procurement says that universal acceptance um, and vendors who have um, demonstrated that their systems are you have universal acceptance and are ready for universal acceptance that those vendors will get a preference let me say this in the world that we live in those kinds of incentives that can be driven by policy development that can be driven by economic incentive creation that don't really cost a whole lot 
for the organizations or the governments uh, or the procuring organizations that do the procurement, but it really provides an impetus and a prompt to those who are competing for business to say, we need to prioritize um, universal acceptance and the resolution of universal acceptance uh, are an important priority for this organization. Otherwise, it just falls in the priority scheme. That's one thing. The, the other thing that um, we ought to consider is should we continue to look at this and talk about this as domain names, as internationalized domain names, as internationalized email addresses? Because I don't know about you, but for me, I'm a technical person, but even for me as a technical person, when I hear IDNs or our EAI or acronyms like that, eyes glaze over, right? Should there not be a, a simplification of what we are actually trying to solve for? We're trying to solve for not just the ability to access parts of the internet, ability to be able to communicate in your own language, uh, but we're also solving for accessibility, right? So perhaps we ought to start thinking about um, changing the dialogue, the terms of the dialogue from internationalization and from these technical terms that were invented 20, 25 years ago. I was a part of it. So I'm, I'm guilty uh, of one of the people who has perpetuated it. But I think it's time to start talking about what the users of the internet actually value, which is access in my own language, right? So it's about digital accessibility, digital inclusion. And I think that universal acceptance is a, an internationalized domain names, that entire area fits underneath that. Um, and I think it's time to elevate the dialogue and focus on policy-based um, initiatives that can actually drive that kind of digital inclusion. So it seems to me that there is definitely a space for um, some marketing wizards <laughs> uh, uh, as, as we move to, to promote this whole issue set. Um, Ram, I, just, I did want to note that um, and emphasize Ram's point about uh, the role of governments and procurement policies. I think this has been consistently one of um, the, the recommendations uh, that um, has been made by, by the community that is focused on universal acceptance. Oh, I see we have a hand, please. Hello, thanks. Um, my name is Niels Brock from uh, Rhizomatica and DW Academy. Um, kind of a comment in the in the question, so I think it's a very interesting debate. Um, but my question goes a bit: Is this about acceptance of uh, multilingualism, or is it also about the construction uh, and co-creation of a multilingual internet? So uh, my point would be: uh, Are we aiming to make more languages available on platforms, or are we also looking on how can we build a more decentralized internet? Um, uh, from uh, from bottom up, so to say, and uh, the experience. Uh, w what I want to share is working a lot with community networks, and uh, there's also uh, a need and uh, uh, to or like a vision to create its proper uh, infrastructure. For instance, to uh, why not host a local server? Why not host a local email server? And that a problem I think is twice fault because. Uh, 
I would say there is an uh, intersectionality between language, but also between uh, uh, big tech and the acceptance uh, not only of language, but also of alternative uh, technologies. And I agree, it's like a policy issue, but uh, if you would like to uh, run a local server even before, uh, and with a local web hosting, maybe even before to touch the language base, uh, it would be just blocked uh, because uh, there's a protocol that is not updated or it goes into spam because automatically for uh, some reasons, uh, configurations of Gmail or whatever, um, this is not uh, shown as other emails uh, would be that come from uh, like a big provider. And I think uh, this is a very important uh, intersection. And so my question uh, would be, I agree, it's, it's not only about uh, domain names. It goes uh, uh, a, lot, a lot deeper maybe on this level. And yeah, well, question if you uh, see this like in a similar way or uh, how do you also think if we uh, think of a diverse internet also in terms of technology and, and the policies that should uh, yeah, provide for that. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to turn to um, one of our speakers, expert speakers, uh, to see if they might be able to respond to that question or anybody else. Oh, Dawit has his hand up and then, so Dawit and then Edwin. Uh, th th thank you. This is an excellent question uh, or comment. Uh, I completely agree. Uh, one of the frustrations of many communities is that uh, they are less and less, uh, you know, empowered to decide on what they can, uh, how they can use their languages, uh, especially, uh, for example, platforms uh, might decide which languages should be you know, a load on their platforms and you have to wait for someone else to decide when your language uh, will be available. So uh, I completely agree that we need to empower communities to decide what is important for their languages, uh, what should be supported and not someone else. Unfortunately, this is easily said than done uh, very often. Uh, we, uh, you know, uh, these platforms uh, and other tech companies are uh, becoming more and more powerful and they decide on um, our lives. So uh, in a way, uh, we had uh, more possibilities to decide for ourselves uh, before than we do today. So I don't know how this will happen, but I completely agree that it is important that uh, you know the communities have a say on what uh, is available on thank you yeah um i i think it's a great idea in fact uh, i i don't know whether you intended it as an idea but um uh bringing up the the uh community networks um i think it's a really good model to learn from and and work with so um uh cuz that's, that would be a group that is just building up the infrastructure for themselves, and obviously uh, local language makes a lot of sense uh, in that uh, you know in that case as well. So, um, but back to your question part: uh, is it acceptance or co-creation? I think it's both, right? It's co-creation for uh, a multilingual internet, which is to work with local communities to build up a multilingual internet for them. Uh, and domain names and email addresses being the fundamental parts of that multilingual internet. And the acceptance part, as you really pointed out, the acceptance part is the big tech and the, and the other systems around the internet so that it remains one internet and for them to, to accept as well. Yeah, of course you can build some uh, uh, complete uh, a s separate uh, infrastructure for, for, for multilingual spots of internet, but we want one uh, 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 interoperable uh, internet, and that's the acceptance part. So, so I think that's a very uh, good and interesting way to think about it, and definitely uh, is one, one of, uh, I don't know why I've never thought about it, but the, um, uh, the, the community networks uh, group uh, uh, initiatives are really something we can learn from and, and, and work with. Thank you so much. Um, just in the interest of time, I, I'd like for us to move on to the last, uh, the last question, which is, in what ways does internet multilingualism support the broader goal of digital inclusion? Um, I feel like we have canvassed um, a, a lot of this already, but I 
I think it's a very crucial question uh, that we should examine. And so I'd like to turn to um, Teresa Swinehart. So I think we, we actually covered quite a few areas um, of what this entails, and I really like the conversations about the local community networks and um, some of the challenges also that have been experienced at uh, different points of using the internet or using multilingual content around that. Um, I think it also demonstrates no one entity can face this alone but the broader awareness of the dependencies amongst each other of the different systems, whether it's the underlying technology, the domain name system, internationalized domain names, or the ability to access the content and how that works. So I think, uh, you know, to, to reiterate the opportunity here around um, more and more awareness uh, to this. And so as we look at uh, some ways to help support this, you know, there had been, um, last year we had uh, the opportunity around uh, the Universal Acceptance Day. Uh, and really quite a remarkable level of uh, participation uh, by the community, uh, by uh, the global community around that. And there will be another one uh, this coming year. Uh, but listening to this conversation, there's actually, I think, an opportunity to look at it uh, not just as a universal acceptance day and awareness, but actually awareness about all the different elements that contribute to it. The local community networks, um, the ability to have certain content online, uh, the partnerships with different entities and different organizations around that. Uh, so that's certainly one area that we'll be looking at and I think will certainly uh, help support the broader aspect about the inclusivity. Uh, it's, all, it's all very nice to talk about the inclusivity, but there's different roles and responsibilities around it. Uh, and those roles and responsibilities in many ways are driven either by economics or demand or uh, passion or whatever it might be. And I think the examples of procurement, government procurement options, we've seen that in IPv6 and other things uh, to be successful. Uh, and I think we can see it in other areas as well. Uh, so in addition to the universal acceptance uh, awareness building and, and really creating that awareness, um, I think the other area, and we touched upon this briefly, uh, we have the, the opening of the next round. We're still developing some of the policies around that. Some of the policies actually do go towards the internationalized domain name elements uh, or um, applications that might be coming in in different forms uh, around that. So that, that work is still underway. Um, and the the, um, the guidelines for the actual uh, taking of applications is still underway, and when it opens up, hopefully that affords another another tool in the kitchen cabinet, if I could put it that way, uh, and another uh, resource and opportunity to contribute towards the broader elements of uh, a, a a a global internet. Uh, and I think the um, the terminology of acceptance and uh, co-creation. Uh, and con contributing towards that. So I'll leave it with that, but uh, really this has been an invaluable conversation. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Len. This is a very fascinating conversation, and um, I might uh, toss in a couple of other thoughts. One is, um, and, and I, I learned this, I guess, just coming to Japan and trying to figure out how the remote control works or how to get ATM <laughs> money out of the ATM, but or or even you know most other things uh, in in terms of navigating. Um, but one is, I think we we should, and I think it was mentioned earlier, we shouldn't discount the role of iconography in this whole discussion. I think uh, there's been a lot of, especially as an entry point. To uh, to get either access to the internet or get started somewhere, it's a it, to me it's like you know like a driving a car. I mean, I just think about small things like knowing which side of the the car the gas tank is on. You know, just little little things like that. I think that have built up as convention over the years, and I think so. Convention and, and iconography can be a valuable tool. I think here, the other one is is as I watched especially since the, the, certainly the beginning of the pandemic uh, of the, the use of, you know, not, just not typing anything, but just pointing your phone at something and, or 
or even speaking something that uh, at least gets you through some sort of artificial intelligence that says, I recognize this language, I'm gonna convert everything. So I guess my, my main point is here is, um, and I know it's the topic of the conversation, but I think you know, relying on uh, the uh, domain name system, if you will, and domain names uh, to solve the context problem of language is probably not very scalable in the long run um, because there's gonna be so many other things that we're gonna to have to do with the internet that are gonna rely on that context. So I would make a, a case for saying, let's look at the, uh, the uh, efforts going on in identity management and some of those contexts to be able to help because we'll have a lot of technology to throw at this. We'll have a lot of stuff to be able to say uh, within one or two phrases, I know what language you're speaking no matter where you are in the world, and then be able to adapt that. Uh, and then the content and everything else gets kind of set. Or I arrive even as an email address, it maybe, you know, maybe even the email address system relies more on identity management. I gave a talk a long time ago back when I worked for a telephone company that, um, you know, we should just forget about using phone numbers at all because my daughter knew none of her friends' their phone numbers. You know, she relied on some other context for that, you know, uh, through whatever, whatever platform she was on. And you gotta realize that people are gonna have more than one presence on the internet, and you know, maybe var var based on their, their social network or their business network or something else like that. So anyway, it's just a thought, but I, I would say that um, we should look for uh, other ways to uh, take care of this problem other than the domain name system. And I'm not discounting making it a good working domain name system in the context of language and characters. But still, I think we shouldn't get over-reliant on that as a solution. So, thank you. Hi, Pat Kane with Verisign. So this morning when we started off, we talked, the, what came up was preservation of cultures, preservation of languages. And we've drifted into domain names and DNS. And I think the example with, put, with the two coming together over the last 20 years is .cat uh, with, for, for Catalan. And so when you talk about .cat, they, they, they bid for new TLD, and they had one policy, which was if, you, if your cat linked to a website, you had to have Catalan content on it. Catalan content grew tremendously in that time frame. So, so Catalan, 26 characters in their alphabet, um, they do have the sedia on the keyboard, so you know, so they can do other uh, other 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 um, words in their language, but but that's really the opportunity here. But when we talk about creating a movement for universal awareness, we're talking about spending a lot of money to solve a problem at the edge of the internet that is thwarted every day by the core of the internet, and that's the ASCII problem that we have that DNS handles that. Well, we, what I don't think we've done recently is taken a look at the DNS infrastructure itself in terms of resolution software, what happens at recursive servers, what happens at authoritative servers. Uh, I do know that, you know, th th that years ago when we launched IDNs at VeriSign in .com, we did use a wildcard at the authoritative server to interpret UTF-8 and UTF-16 so that we didn't have to do just ASCII. And it worked clunky, but it was uh, initial implementation, and then we had a wildcard prohibition uh, put in place for a, a lot of reasons. Uh, but but have we, saw, have we thought about solving it at the core so that we don't have these limitations that we have at the edge today, or should we? Thank you. Um, well, just uh, recognizing the time, I'd like to make a few points to conclude. And um, if any of our speakers would like to consider a, maybe a very brief intervention or a, a winding up point, uh, please do. Um, but I would uh, just say that this has been a tremendously uh, vibrant and um, dynamic conversation. I know we aren't many in this room, but that hasn't limited the kind of diversity of thoughts and perspectives that have been uh, contributed to this conversation. Um, we had intended to focus on the collaboration between different institutions uh, moving forward to promote universal acceptance, but um, we've run out of time. I would just say that 
um, in the upcoming uh, council working group on internet at the ITU, um, there have been multiple submissions uh, from different countries on um, this very subject, on universal acceptance. So um, that those submissions will be discussed on October 18th. Uh, so I think that this discussion was quite timely. Um, uh, and I, I'll wrap it up there, but I see Aki Nori, you would like to say something, and I don't know if anybody else uh, would like to too, but. Let me just say <laughs> thank you so much to our expert speakers um, for their time, and thank you also to um, everybody who's joined us today. But Akinori, over to you. Thank you very much. So um, I'm really uh, impressed with, uh, with this discussion, and then I, I, I'm thinking about uh, it's quite a multi-stakeholder process to uh, make, uh, make a digital inclusion, and then uh, uh, you know, to to uh, to uh, in the in the part of the setup, the identifiers policy, that I can I can do the st still a job with the community, the great uh, great variety of the community uh, community effort, and then uh, uh, the ma many many la language community ha ha have been involved in the, in the setting the the uh, the uh, 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 generation role. And then uh, the I I can I can is so still still doing the the IDN policies for the, the new GTAD uh, uh, program so that that's a, that's a quite a big effort and then uh, I, I as I said that uh, that there it, it is really uh, integral part uh, part is the platform uh, vendor uh, who. Uh, for cover the ma 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 multilingual uh, the IDN and the uh, universal acceptance ready, and then uh, that's that's uh, the crucial part because uh, uh, the the platform uh, the common platform uh, manufacturer if if they are uh, the UA ready then uh, almost all uh, the system are UA ready then uh, that's a very crucial part, and then uh, uh, the public public policy will uh, will encourage the, the a lot of the U U uh, end user system. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, move forward for the universal acceptance. So that's that's really, uh, really, uh, really important. So uh, this is a quite that everyone uh, need to uh, do do their own job for the the advancing the data inclusion, which is really uh, like a multi-stakeholder approach of the internet. Thank you. Thank you. And just one last important point. So um, uh, the organizers of the session uh, will pour over the transcript and the contents and uh, create a synthesis of the discussion and develop a report. Um, and you can probably anticipate that coming out in maybe December. So we want to take some great care with uh, how we treat the content of the session. Uh, so please look for that on the IGF website. All right, thanks everybody and have a great day.